very breath of God, Father, would fill that place. I know, Lord, you've been so present in ministering to her. But we stand with our sister Denise, and we ask that the very breath and life of God would fill her lungs, Father God. Total healing, total health in Jesus' name. We break the power of this infirmity and this assignment in Jesus' name. And we say no, and we say yes to life for Denise Skinner today. Father, strengthen her body, strengthen her lungs, her circulatory system. Father, strengthen our brother Steve and his whole family, that church, as they stand together in faith, God. And Father, those even throughout the church that had COVID, and there's a, we just speak health and strength and recovery to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And be praying for their church. Uh, they had about eight in the church that had COVID, and I know another woman was also on a ventilator. So be praying for Solid Rock. Yeah. Amen. And uh, we love Steve and Denise. They're great people. And even if they weren't great people, we'd still love them and pray for them. But, you know, let's just pray for them. Amen. Jamie, come and make a few announcements. We have many announcements this morning. Many. And I was like, we can split this up um, first, I just want to say thank you, Amy and I both want to say thank you for all of you who helped with the baptism last week and the cooking and the, the shower and all of those things. There was, you know, people sent gifts. They went on the Amazon thing. It was great. You know, I'm like, yay, look what we have to work with now. It's like real stuff. We're so excited. And I know Shelly's been trying to send thank you notes, but some things came without um, telling us who sent it. So if you don't get a thank you notes, because we it's not because we didn't love you and didn't appreciate what you sent. We just don't know who sent it. So, but thank you so much. Um, we're thrilled. We're going to have an ice maker. Yay. As soon as the, the plumber's like, yay. Um, but, yeah. He still has to do it. <laughs> so anyway, we're really, really thankful for so many different things that will make life so much better in the kitchen. And you think that's not that big a deal until you get some nice stuff. And you're like, oh, look, this is our first time to have a deep sink with yes. a whole bunch of things to wash and do after a fellowship. And I was like, yay. <laughs> and a dishwasher and all of those things that made a huge difference. So thank you guys who, who sent things to us and all that was great. Um, are we all Tuesday night? entertainment this week. <laughs> I can't wait. I just can't wait. Y'all, our, our, our church, they start playing their ball games Tuesday night. Woo! What's, what time's the first one? Six. Six o'clock. Oh, wow. They do two. Oh. <laughs> oh, they do, I think they play two back to back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was like, can they do that? They're going to. Woo! Yeah. And then we're going to hand out magnesium and everything. <laughs> Who is? Oh, Cash, are you the standby nurse? Oh, thank you all. <laughs> yeah. So where, where do you guys play at? Regional. Regional Park. Okay. Six o'clock is the first game. This will be great entertainment. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. It's going to be. <laughs> it will be back to back. It's fast. No, it will be great fun. And you know what? What a great summertime fellowship. Yes, amen. You know? Bring a drink. Bring a drink for those who are playing for after. I don't know. Bring Have your lawn chairs. Enjoy. Hey, I heard yesterday somebody who doesn't even know y'all, they just watch you practice. So this is going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good. So that's Tuesday night. That starts Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Regional Park. I think it'll be great fun. I think it'll be great fellowship. And I'm looking forward to That's right. Thank you. I was like, going through the week. Wednesday, Thursday. Saturday is the men's meeting. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Men's meeting. Saturday morning here. You meet over there still? Okay. So you'll, you'll find the door. Just keep pulling until one opens. <laughs> <laughs> 10 o'clock, come Saturday morning for the men's meeting. Just, um, I think they're learning good stuff. Or, I don't know. 
They talk in smack or something. I don't know. They're, they talk a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple announcements also. I know you guys have seen me, and I know many have already registered. But remember, Global Awakenings Greater Things Conference is August 4th through the 7th in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, I know a lot of us have registered, but if you haven't registered and you still want to go, um, I can give you a discount code that gives you $20 off, okay? Um, but it's for Global Harvest Church members. Um, also, the premium seating for that has already sold out. So if you want to go, you probably need to register pretty quickly. Um, one of Global Awakening, this has become Global Awakening's biggest conference. And it's, uh, they really focus on this a lot. Um, the speakers are gonna be Randy Clark, Andy Bird, Catherine Ruinola, Tom Jones, Will Hart, Michael and Jessica Kulianis, Sean and Krista Smith, William Wood, Brian Starley, Charity Cook, worship from Upper Room, Chris and Summer Sheely, and Martin Smith. And Martin was the lead singer of Delirious for many years, and it's going to be a really powerful conference. So if you can be a part of that, it's in the brand new convention center there in Oklahoma City, which is connected to the Omni Hotel. Uh, I've put links in the private group, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. It's a big deal that they're coming to Oklahoma. And as and there are some things that we specifically are going to share about Oklahoma and what God's doing at this moment. Amen. Also, another opportunity that we have as a church to minister to our community. Um, I went to a meeting this week, and we'd actually gone to a meeting before COVID. And just because of COVID, um, we weren't, a lot of churches didn't get involved in this. But there's a ministry that's and I can't remember, uh, terrible, I can't remember the exact name, but it has to do with a care portal for ministering to the needs of families that are taking care of foster children. And many churches in the community, not many, several have gotten involved. They're looking for more churches. Uh, but in order for us to do that, I need a volunteer. And we always are looking for ways to minister more to our community. Um, but if you want to volunteer and be the contact for Global Harvest Church, to do that, an example is they put out a need in their care portal, and uh, you know what church can say, "Hey, this family needs a car seat for this foster child that they just got last night." You know, needs like that. Then local churches, one church has says, "Hey, we'll take care of that," or another church says, "We'll meet this need," and that's kind of what that looks like. And uh, I know we have uh, people like Laura and Dina who uh, work in those. Uh, Capacities and have shared some of the needs that our community really great, great need in Ardmore and the surrounding regions for this ministry. And so if you want to be a part of that, I put that need out with a few. This is not taking care of children in your home, okay? So um, I know some people are like, I ain't doing that. But if you want to be a connection to help families, and if you do want to keep children in your home, do that because a lot of we know that a lot of kids in Ardmore when they go into the foster care program they're not even staying in this community because of the lack of families to care for them this is a way that we as a church can further meet a big need in this community so um, I put that out on social media no volunteers yet so if you want our church yes okay can you do that even though you're working through DHS okay What's that? I don't work through DHS. Okay. I don't know anything. <laughs> right. Awesome. Yeah. I think it's pretty simple. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I gathered, like I said, I went to a meeting. I gathered a lot of the information. I'll give that to you, and you can go on. And more than one person, I think, can do it. You know, but if we have someone just to kind of head that up, we do. But we as a church can... Laura can present the need, saying, hey, this is the need that we have. You know, if someone wants to do it, if, you know, if no one comes forward to do it, and we as a church, you know, corporately will do that. But we want to be a part of that. Amen? Praise God. That's awesome. All right. Amen. Let's take an offering. Amen. And uh, we're going to make our offering declaration. Someone did ask me a week or two ago, they said, is it okay if we give more than our tithe? <laughs> And 
I said yes. <laughs> that is totally acceptable. And there are things that I assume that people understand, but you're welcome to give more than your tithe. If you feel led, you know, to give more than that, by all means, you, 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 you are more than free to give um, more than the tithe. Amen. So let's stand together. Uh, I know many of us give online, and you can give at globalharvestchurch.co. And uh, let's just make our offering declaration together. Heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams and visions, impartations, angelic visitations, declarations, and divine manifestations. Anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will share our favor, blessing, and increase upon me, so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his role and reward. Hallelujah. Amen. So just bring those in worship. Hallelujah. God's faithful. Amen. He's good. And we just thank him for his great faithfulness. Amen. Nora is excited about giving. Hallelujah. Thanks, God. All right. At this time, let's dismiss the kids to go to their program, to Children's Church and Nursery. There's a few. Many are on vacation. exciting about that. I think we saw the fruit of several things happening. First of all, we see the long-term fruit of the Christian school, yeah. right? When, when you're not only discipling children every day, but you're touching their families as well. And it's so powerful to see families getting baptized together. Yeah. Amen. Uh, the, the, also the fruit of families pouring into their children, right? Many, many uh, children in this body um, being impacted by not only what the school and what the church are doing, but what their families are pouring into them every, every day. I mean, I tell you, you know, we, and we know from uh, having a Christian school and a church, um, those things are amazing, but they can never replace what you as a parent do. Because if, if a family doesn't live a certain way and pour into their children, what we do as a church and a school won't have a long-lasting effect. So families, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, thank you for pouring into you, those in your family because that really makes the difference. Uh, if we want to see, and I'm going to talk about that further today, if we want to see transformation that changes a nation, we have to focus on raising up godly families. One of, one of the things that is so affecting our nation are issues like fatherlessness, right? not having healthy families, poverty, lack of education, all those things. Those have a tremendous impacts on the family long term. Right? And what that does generationally, we must have strong godly families because the way the family goes is the way the church goes. And the way the church goes is the way the nation goes. So praise God for you as godly families. You are making an incredible difference. You really are. You're making it. It was so fun seeing Damon's daughters all get baptized. Right? It was so awesome they didn't come back. No, seriously. They're, they're on vacation, gone out of state to see some family, and we just... It's great when you, we can do those things. But 
family is making a difference, right? And here, and sometimes it doesn't look as glamorous as a big crusade or an outreach, but family and church and school will have long-lasting fruit, and it will bear fruit that will remain for generations. Right? And we have to understand that if we really want to see our culture transform. Amen. So those are great, great truths. So now one of the things that, um, you know, as an apostolic church, as a prophetic church, and that, you know, one of the things we've talked about over the years, first of all, if you want to be an apostolic church, you have to be linked to an apostle somehow. If you want to be a prophetic church, you have to be linked to prophets that, that teach and train you to move in the things of the Spirit. Amen. And one of the primary anointings of, of apostles and prophets is to actually shift the culture in a city and a region. Amen. And so we're really called to do that. And, you know, a church in a region is called to do more than meet together on a Sunday morning. Now, that's a starting point, right? Because if you, if you don't do that, you're really not a disciple. But that is only the beginning part, right? And uh, because we're actually, you know, that's a primary method of discipleship is gathering on, whether it's a Sunday morning or whatever that looks like, you know. But, uh, like, we, we are called to do much more than that. And we've talked about uh, apostleship and apostles, and that's really not my emphasis this morning. But um, really, you know, being an apostle, it's more than a title. It's actually a task, right? And, uh, and our task as an apostolic church and an apostolic people is we are called to see, uh, as a group of people, a city transformed by the presence and the power of Jesus. And, uh, you know, we're going to look at a model of what transformation looks like. It's a passage of scripture we've looked at before, but I, I often go back to this passage of scripture as a checklist and say, God, are we doing what we need to do to see transformation happen in our city? Amen. Because how many know it's easy sometimes in um, the junk of life to forget what you're doing? And forget what you're living for. Forget the destiny and the purpose that God gives for you individually. Because I watch people sometimes, and I, I find it in my own life. God, I want to stay on track of what you've said to me individually to do. What you said to my family to do. But also as a church, we have to stay on track. Right? Even in the summer. To do what God's called us to do. Amen. Now, we had an interesting week. Um, I forget what day it was. I know I, I shared this. With, it was on June 10th. Okay. I woke up from a dream on June 10th, and I knew it was very strategic. Okay. And um, as we talked, as I talked to Jamie, as we talked to people throughout the day, multiple people had dreams that night and the nights around that many of them having the same dream. And so we all know that God speaks through dreams. Okay, now like everything else, you have to discern your dream, right? However, sometimes God gives a certain dream or dreams that they're so specific that they don't need a lot of interpretation. Sometimes God just does a visitation in your dream uh, and, and God just shows up and he declares that he's going to do something, amen? So, in, and I'll start with my dream, and then I'm going to have Jamie share what she dreamt as well. But in my dream, I was at um, the campus of Oklahoma State. Okay. Now, dream language, right? That doesn't mean this is just about Oklahoma State University. It was actually about the state of Oklahoma. And I was in a student chapel service there. And, uh, of course, I'm not a student at Oklahoma State, uh, but there were, it wasn't a big gathering, but there were uh, Randy Clark, Dr. Sam Matthews, and Becca Greenwood were all ministering in this gathering. 
And uh, as they were laying hands on people, people began to fall out under the power of God. And people were just getting whacked, right, in a good way. I was getting whacked. It was awesome. And uh, so it's interesting to me because when you look at those three ministries, first of all, you have Dr. Sam Matthews, who many of us know, and uh, out of Family of Faith in Shawnee, Oklahoma, who's the president of Family of Faith University, uh, which hosts the, the graduate program that I just graduated from, the doctoral program that's coming. And, and Sam has been, Sam has believing for a statewide outpouring that God showed him literally decades ago, probably in the 1970s. He saw where there was a moment where there was a crack in the heavenly realm. And in a matter of weeks, 150,000 people who had never been born again got saved. Right. And the Lord also showed him the strategy for this revival was that he was commissioned to raise up the local church in Oklahoma. Right? Because how many of you know, you can't contain a harvest without the local church. You know how people get discipled? Part of the, it's part of the local church. Right? You know the best way to reach a community? Plant a church. Even if there are multiple churches in a region, the best way to reach your community statistically proven over and over again is to plan a church okay now bible studies are good worship events are good prayer times are good those are all things and a lot of people run from place to place trying to produce something but what really produces things are those ministries working with the local church so so god showed sam that 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 was to happen and so he spent much of his life not only traveling to the nations but praying for God to raise up the church in local areas. And that's his, his apostolic strategy. He's been a part of planting many churches. There are specific regions that God showed them that churches were supposed to come forth. Some of those places, churches have come forth. Some of those places, church have not come forth, right? But, but so Sam's in that dream. And he, to me, he's a gatekeeper in the state of Oklahoma. Then you have Randy Clark, which obviously we have a connection to Randy as an apostolic ministry that we are connected to as a church. Uh, but in addition to that, one of the reasons that uh, Global Awakening brings a conference like Greater Things to Oklahoma is to give the church an impartation and infusion in that region to refresh, restore, renew, and empower them for revival, okay? So I think it's very, very strategic that Global Awakening is coming into Oklahoma at this time. Now, I'll give you some fun news, too, that happens. Jamie and I are going to be featured in Global Awakening's next Partners magazine that comes out next month. And um, I've written an article about that. I've sent them pictures. But we're going to, and they like, we, we wanted to feature someone especially from Oklahoma because of what we're doing in greater things. Now, they may read it and look at our picture and say, we need someone more exciting. I don't know. <laughs> but that is happening. So, so we have Global Awakening, Randy Clark. Randy shows up in my dreams a lot. Usually when he does, um, I had a dream years ago that he showed up and everybody was like, Randy Clark's coming to your house. Right? To me, which says that there's a, an anointing that, Maybe literally Randy physically isn't coming here, but that anointing for signs, wonders, miracles, that same anointing is being released in the local church. Amen. So when people like that show up in your dreams, it's generally they're showing up to give you an impartation of something that they carry. And I believe this dream was speaking of not only an impartation for one person or one church, but an impartation for the church in the state of Oklahoma. The third person was Becca Greenwood. And uh, of course, many of us know Becca was here last November. Powerful, powerful meetings. I mean, those that were, of you that were a part of that, it was a life-changing impartation that Becca gave to us. And, and Becca's a prophet. She's an intercessor. She goes into regions not only to prophesy, and we know some of the things that she prophesied here was revival. Right? I shared with her 
the word that, that basically Ian gave, Ian Carroll, one of the times that he was here, that he like, Ardmore reminds me of Redding, California 15 years ago. Uh, like you're on the cusp of a city and regional move that's about to break out in your region, right? Of citywide transformation. Becca's very strategic. That's one of her assignments is as a prophet, as an, an intercessor, to shift regions. Amen. Now, I shared that dream with most people. What I didn't dream was, that, what I didn't share was there another part at the end of the dream where um, after this chapel service and this impartation, I was like, I got to get to class. Right? And I'm on this big campus and I'm trying to find my class and I almost can't find it. Right? Happens sometimes in my dreams. And I'm, finally, I find it. I rush into class and guess who my professor is? Becca Greenwood. So I think that of course, we know that Becca will be back with us at the end of September here in the church. So I, there, there's something about a convergence of ministries that the Lord says, okay, it, it, does this show us how important the body of Christ is? You can't be a lone ranger and see transformation come. You have to have a convergence of specific ministries that the Lord sent, and we've understood that, and I talked a couple of weeks ago, I preached on being at a well of revival and planting a well of revival and digging a well of revival in a region. And that's different than just from running from place to place and meeting to meeting to get blessed. Instead, you say, I'm planted in this place and I'm going to, even in the middle of a dry place, I'm going to dig something that produces revival and awakening. And it's more than me just getting blessed. It's about me and us becoming an agent of change, of glory, of catalyst and revival to see a transformation, not just a revival, and I want revival, but, but a revival going into awakening. And our, our city needs an awakening, right? Some of us need an awakening. There are places in my heart I need an awakening. And we need a transformation to come and transform culture, right? And so it's about us saying, Lord, we're, we're positioning ourselves. And, and a well of revival understands that there are gifts and ministry gifts that are not just what we have, amen, but of people coming in and depositing a permanent impartation into a church, into a city, into a region, into a state to shift and cause a transformation to happen. Amen. Now that starts with faithfulness. Right? You can't shift a culture without being faithful. And faithfulness is more than just being physically present. I mean, when we show up on Sunday morning, it's like, God, we're here. We're not just here physically. Our focus and our intention is upon worshiping you and what you're doing and what you're saying. It's releasing faith to receive what God is saying and to also give out to one another what the Lord is releasing through us so that transformation and breakthrough can happen in a region. Now, there's more that happened. Jamie, that same night, also had a very specific dream, so I want her to come and share about the dream she had. So, he can't really say no to me at this moment, so I'm going to, I really, there, I actually, the night before this dream he wants me to share, the night before, I had another dream, and I really think it really fits, as I was sitting there pondering this, uh, I had a dream about Patricia King. You know who Patricia King is? She's a prophet. I really haven't really known much about Patricia, Patricia until these last couple of years going to, with, you know, being involved with Randy Clark and some of those things. Anyway, she's a very well-known prophet. She's part of Global Awakening. Yeah, she's part of the network. And, and, you know, we've seen her voice of the prophets and some of those things, and I just, I've just been blown away. But anyway, um, in this dream, the only parts that I remember, it involves you guys. And that's why I'm like, I feel like I just need to share this part because of what he's talking about. These dreams aren't just, you know, oh, Jimmy had a dream, he had a dream, blah, blah, blah. No, it's about all of us and our part 
is the strategy that we play. And I don't know where we were, but someone looked at me and said, hey, could you host, host Patricia King for lunch and her team at your house? Like today? <laughs> if you know me, when my house is rarely clean, too, there's rarely food there. And I was just like, so I just remember looking around and taking off towards my house. And I'm in my house, and all of you are in my house, and you're just doing the stuff. You're setting the table, you're getting the food right, you're doing the thing, and I just like, we're hosting Patricia King and her team. And it's okay, we can do this, and it's going to leave such a mark on our lives, in our city, you know, because your house represents church, right? My house represents my house, but it also represents the house, right? So anyway, it was at my house, my physical house, but all of you were there and you were doing the stuff and I'm like, okay, yeah, we got this. You know, I really probably needed that to know, you know what, we got this. And I saw that last Sunday when everyone just started doing their part. And just, it was just a beautiful thing. Anyway, I believe that even in those, I mean, the dream never ended with Patricia King at our house or any of those things. That, But I still believe that we get those kinds of impartations and we're hosting the apostles and the prophets and we do it well. You know, and we all just step up when it's time to step up and, do, and we're hosting the king. So the dream I had the next night, the same night Andy had this dream, um, I was having psychotic dreams. Crazy, crazy, but right in the middle was one little part. Just pay attention to those things, right? And in this dream, I just kind of landed at the beginning of downtown Ardmore. And I'm looking and I'm like, we're in downtown Ardmore, and what is going on here? There's a red carpet going down the street. There's a white horse standing there, and all of a sudden I knew we were, I just had walked upon a royal wedding. And Marcia's standing next to me all of a sudden, and I said, who's getting married? She said, Betsy's daughter, Amy. I've never, uh, Betsy is a family friend of Amy's parents and Alan's parents. I've never met Amy. Don't know who Amy is. I wouldn't know her if I saw her. I just know she has a daughter named Amy. And Marcia goes, Amy is marrying the king. And I began to sob. Because I felt the joy of Marilyn Rudd. That she was so excited that Amy was marrying the king. And then I began to feel all of heaven Rejoice. I just cried and cried in my dream because I could feel the rejoicing of heaven, what was happening, and that Amy is marrying the king. And I'm like, so I tell Amy, I was like, I don't even know. You know, and so people go, well, what does Amy mean? Amy, Amy means beloved. The king has come to Ardmore to marry his beloved. So I share that with the intercessors and that we share Amy's. Oh, in downtown, you know, the, the streets were lined with benches facing one direction, and it was like they were cafe benches, which I think is interesting. Like if you were to go into an old diner or something, those were the kind of benches. And some of them had tables before them, but they were all facing the one direction. They weren't, you know, facing. Anyway, so they're there's that table there. there there's that place for us at the wedding there, there's that that place um so i'm just fixing that i did say the red carpet already uh -huh. Ooh, <laughs> patricia means noble okay so anyway that's up my train of thought i have enough trouble staying focused um so, you know, we put this out. We tell the intercessors, like, oh, because I knew. I knew if we had had a dream, Emily gets up. She didn't have a wedding dream or a dream, but she'd had a dream. Anybody have dreams about Joe Moody? A lot of people are having dreams about Joe Moody lately. 
Um, I text, oh, she texted me, so I texted her back. People are dreaming about you around here. Um, anyway, so Emily had a dream, and it, it was about Joe Moody, and we were waiting in a helicopter to, to meet up with her and all of those things. Anyway, that's another story. But I put that out because I knew if we are having some dreams tonight, some other people are having some dreams. Pay attention. God dreams, not harassment dreams, right? And so started getting messages from people. And that's theirs to tell. But, you know, one was like, I was downtown Oklahoma City looking for a wedding dress. And I kept telling them, it wasn't my dream. Okay, it's Olivia's dream. And she kept looking for the dress, and the people were giving her a dress, and it wasn't a white dress. She's like, no, it's a white dress. It has to be a white dress. And it's for the renewal, is what the word that she said. She was looking for a wedding dress for the renewal. Diana had a dream the same night about downtown Ardmore. She was helping a young lady named Amy get ready for her wedding. God saying something. <laughs> it's just a powerful moment. He's coming to this city. He's coming to this state to marry his beloved. And the thing was, we never saw the wedding in the dream. It was all about the preparation and getting the things ready and how things were being set up. Wow. Oh, that's kind of powerful. Mm -hmm. For the king to marry his beloved. It's a powerful thing. Amen. So and I think we need to make ourselves ready. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's something that now, am I talking about Jesus physically returning and life as we know it on earth ending? That's not what I'm talking about. But if he wants to do that, he has more than permission to do that. He doesn't need my permission. Right? Because there will come a moment when the Lord manifests and the earth will be changed and all things will be made new. Right? Uh, there's that reality. But there's this reality that, uh, you know, and we've talked about it before in the Welsh Revival. When um, revival came in 1904... And they heard two children walking down the street, and one said, don't you know what's happening? And the other one said, no, what's going on? He said, well, the king lives here now. Now, he lives in you and me, right? But there's something about when he manifests his presence and his glory in a region, and we have to make ourselves ready. Amen? Now... You know, there, there is a reality that we have a responsibility to partner with him. Because a lot of the church has this mentality, well, if the Lord wants to do it, he'll do it. Y'all heard that? How's that working out? His will be done, but he's looking for, first of all, a bride. And guys, you're the bride too. Right? You may not look good in a wedding dress, but uh, but he's looking for people who will partner with him and say, God, I'm making ready for what you want to do. And I'm partnering with you not only to pray the prayers that need to be prayed. And it was John Wesley who said, basically, nothing happens on the earth without the people of God praying. And what we've done is we've made an excuse with a worldview that says that everything that happens is the will of God. And that's not true. I'm going to say that again. Everything that happens is not the will of God. Because God's looking for people who will partner with him to see his kingdom come and his will be done. And not only in our lives, but in a region. Your assignment is this region. Your assignment is to say, okay, God, first of all, I'm going to let you work in me. And in that process, you're going to start working in me. You're going to start working in my family. You're going to start transforming my church. And in that process, Lord, I'm going to partner with you to see heaven come in a city. Right? And, and I think the reality is we as the church have to understand that, um, you know, 
There are things that I don't want to happen in my, on my watch. You know, we've talked about this over the years. We can either say, well, you know, Ardmore is just a hard place and it's a pastor's graveyard and all this kind of stuff. We can't have nice things. You know, our Walmart is terrible. And some of those things may be <laughs> reality. But when do we begin to do things that start saying, God, we're going to shift the culture. We're going to shift through our prayers, through our obedience. So obedience is important. Through our obeying the word. So obeying scripture is important. And not just picking and choosing what's convenient. I mean, we've got a whole culture filled with immorality right now. Right? Uh, and, and, and saying, God, I'm going to host your glory. I'm going to host your presence. And I, I'm going to begin to work with you. And, and usually it starts small. Right? Let's look at some scriptures here real fast. Don't worry. I'm not preaching the whole sermon. I had a huge amount of notes. But I wanted to communicate some of those things that we were talking about. And those dreams that God is saying something that he is coming. Right? Isn't the crazy thing about a wedding? How many of you in here have ever been married? How many of you are getting married? No. <laughs> it's my faith, right? Yes. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> But isn't it funny that you spend months, if not years, preparing for a wedding, and then in 20 minutes it's done? And you're just like, I spent X amount of dollars for this dress and this ceremony. And, you know, looking back, I know Jim Summers is like, I'll give you this much money to a load. I should have done that. Yeah, is it still on the table? We'll we'll do it again. We can do a marriage renewal in Vegas. I'm, yeah, come on. We'll have a destination renewal wedding if y'all want to go. Not in Vegas? Oh, okay. Well, a beach somewhere. What's he say? Hawaii. Let's do it. Right. Yeah, but <laughs> but sometimes the the preparation, you know, God. God really likes the journey, doesn't he? He likes the process a lot more than we do. Because in the process, he actually produces something eternal. We were watching a show on Disney, and I was like, you know, I'm, I kind of like the fact that Disney's doing this with some of their stuff where they don't just drop the whole thing. It's one week at a time. Because I love the anticipation. And most people don't like that anymore because I want to sit down and binge a whole series. Some people don't like series because, well, I didn't like the first episode. Well, watch the second one. But we're so impatient with the process right now that we don't let. It's true. It's true. Right? Because WandaVision got really good. Right. You watched the one division. It had a lot of spiritual truth in it. Right? No, if prophets don't get healed, they work, they work witchcraft. <laughs> Y'all just go with that. Uh, but, but the process is so important. You know, and, and uh, you know, God, God wants to work with us. To produce something in our family, right? We got a generation now that doesn't value church, and so when they don't value church, getting our kids to church consistently and all that, then what happens in the next generation for a generation that didn't value church? They don't value God because we just sent them a message that God really wasn't important. Pouring into our children is so important. And not when it's just convenient for us. Right? I mean, we saw that last Sunday. 
right? All those kids getting baptized, right? There's something that we have to think of that is multi-generational. Because I don't want to pass from this earth. And my children know deeper darkness than I do. Because if that happens, I fail. Now, I can't control their actions. I sure try. But there's something that every day we have to go after what the Lord's saying for transformation. I just want to look briefly at Acts 19. Let's just look there for just a moment. And uh, uh, because Acts 19 gives us a blueprint for revival and regional transformation. Okay? Now, it starts off appropriately enough with Paul finding uh, a group of about 12 men, and uh, he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed in verse 2 and they said no we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit they were Baptists <laughs> Church of Christ I don't know and, and we bless the Baptists in the Church of Christ amen this is being recorded but I would say it in front of a Baptist and uh, I just hopefully did and uh and he said, into the what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Okay? And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They realized there was a reality that we haven't really been baptized in salvation. I know this is appropriate because we just had a baptismal service. And the thing is that I love about this passage is baptism isn't the end final result. It's the introduction. It's a mark in your life where you're letting not only yourself, your family, your friends know that I'm serious about this thing. But you're declaring to the powers of both heaven and hell. That I'm serious about this, and I'm off limits to you. You want to break the power of some of the harassment in your life that's been harassing you? Get water baptized. Right? Early church, they do water baptism and deliverance in the same setting. Right? It's not just a ritual. Hold them water until that demon comes out. Right? Hold them under. You got a tithe? Okay. <laughs> Uncomfortable laughter. Um, it, but then I love when it goes on and says, and when Paul, after they get baptized, Paul laid his hands upon them. Okay, so if they got baptized, then they were saved. They made a decision, right? Because the word talks over and over again about being brought out of darkness, being brought out of sin. You know, once. We were like corpses, is literally what the Passion Translation says. We're like corpses, but you brought us out of sin and death into life through salvation. Amen? And, um, and then it goes on to say, Paul laid his hands up on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Now, here's an important point. If you want to be personally transformed, you need to pray in tongues. And you need to move in the prophetic. These are not side issues. We make it a side issue. But if you personally want to be transformed, and here's a news flash: you all need to be transformed. I need to be transformed. Each one of us needs to be transformed because no matter where we are in life and how much maturity we've experienced, there's always more because Jesus loves the process. And a lot of times when we think we've arrived, that's when he wants to come in and say, sister, there's more. Brother, there's more. You've encountered a lot of me, but guess what? There's more. There's something further I want to do 
because I love the process and I love working through this with you. And so if you want to be personally transformed, and again, not a side issue. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said, this promise, all these dudes and people that you see that you think are drunk, praying in this unknown language, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many who will call on the name of the Lord. It didn't suddenly shut down when scripture was gathered. Because God understands if we want to experience personal transformation, you need to pray in tongues and you need to be involved in prophetic ministry. Well, I don't like that prophecy stuff. I don't like that tongue stuff. It's really strange. Right? You know, or when you've had a wacky prophecy, you know, and somebody gives you your prophetic word, you're like, I'm trying to make that fit. What are you talking about? Right? We've all been there. Right? But moving in the prophetic anointing will not only transform you, it will change a region. Because right. you can prophesy hell to a region, or you can prophesy destiny to a region. You can prophesy that to your life. You can prophesy that to your family. We'll, we'll eat the fruit of our words long term by what we're believing for. That's why when we planted the church, the Lord told us, dear prophet, you can have what you want in this city by what you begin to declare. And so Paul started, says there were 12 men. These were the 12 men. And he started with a group of people and he said, okay, you're going to get transformed. You're going to get saved. And then you're going to start being transformed. And you need the Holy Spirit to be transformed. Holy Spirit is not a side issue. I had a youth pastor once when I was in the Baptist church. I was just thinking about this a couple of days ago. And a lot of us in our Baptist church in the 80s, our youth group was getting rocked because our old youth pastor got filled with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't go well in a Southern Baptist church. And then we had a new youth pastor, and he was trying to do damage control, and he told us, he said, you know, he said, I, I used to pray in tongues, but I outgrew it. I stepped away. The lightning never struck him. <laughs> We don't outgrow that. Right? We don't outgrow being baptized in a Pentecostal New Covenant spirit. And I'm a Baptist, y'all. But I need the Pentecostal anointing. Right? It's important for transformation of a region. Amen? And the thing about this, and I, I I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to preach all this, but you can go through the book, and I've preached it before, but you can go through, and if you've got, those that got baptized that last Sunday, so awesome, I think only three of them came back. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> they, they, they have to press into personal transformation, right? They have to press into a transformation of their life in their region. And the thing was, Paul challenged the rule of darkness over Ephesus. Right? On three levels. And one of the things that he did that really started, and he, you know, it says he preached in their synagogues, and for three, it was like two and a half to three years, he preached in the synagogue until they kicked him out. And then he preached in a public hall and says, until all the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Right? Because there was something weighing on Paul. He knew that he had a commission from Jesus to preach the gospel to the known world before he died because he knew that eternity was being held in his hands. And he was willing even go to Jerusalem and be martyred because he's like, I've got to get the gospel out to these multitudes before I die. It's the thing. All, the, all those original apostles lived with the weight of 
getting this news out to the known world. Because they understood there was something about eternity that they held in their generation. Oh, that we would live with that same urgency. That we would understand that our generation is dependent on how we handle the gospel. We wouldn't be nearly as flippant. We need to feel the weight of that. We need to feel the weight of a generation and their destiny depends on how we handle the gospel. And Paul challenged the rule of the territorial principality that ruled over Ephesus. Because the temple of Artemis was there, sometimes known as Diana. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. Right? They, they manufactured shrines of this temple. It even goes on to say that there was an image that fell out of heaven that they worshipped in the temple of Diana. Go th read through the, that sometimes. So you read that in passing, but something fell out of heaven and they made an image of it and worshipped it. And it became a territorial spirit in Ephesus. And every May in Ephesus, they had a celebration just for that principality. And they would set up in the temple grounds and priests and sorcerers and people would come from all over the world, the known world in that region, to worship Artemis. That was the place. Now, some of us wouldn't want to plant church there. We'd be like, I just want to stay in Reading. Or let me live in Tulsa. Right. Because I'll argue there. And I'm familiar with Tulsa. Tulsa's a great city. But Paul, Paul, the fullness of Paul's apostolic ministry really came forth in Ephesus. One of the most demonized cities in the world. And the church grew at this incredible rate because, first of all, Paul challenged this territorial spirit on three levels. I believe it was a manifestation of the Queen of Heaven. And the Queen of Heaven is not just some random, that, that's like a, a global principality. Because those demons look for places, they're, you know, it's spiritual dynamics is. The Elohim show up where they're worshipped. Does, does God turn his eye? He's present, but does he manifest his glory in a region where there's obedience and worship? The territorial spirits do the same thing. So it's important what we're worshipping in a region. I worship God, but do we worship money? Do we worship pleasure? What gets worshipped in a region gets exalted. What are we worshipping in our region? Right? And so Paul began to challenge this territorial spirit, first through discipleship, and then people started getting saved. Right? And, and they things happened like, they, they got saved. First of all, the fear of the Lord fell on them. There were, there, there were extraordinary miracles being done through the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and things that he prayed over, that's not just a TV evangelist thing, y'all. Right? It was scriptural. And they take those things and they put them on people and they get healed and they get delivered from demons. Right? Because the anointing is transferable. We'll see that more in just a minute. And so people were even getting delivered from demons when these cloths touched them. So deliverance started happening in a, in a region. You know what one of the first steps after getting people saved and spirit-filled is? You start doing deliverance. And you start dealing with some of the ground-level soldiers you want to get transformed in your life? Don't be too prideful to get deliverance. Because if you resist it, you're resisting a 
transformational move of God that's trying to come to a city. Okay? So, don't think that because you need deliverance that you're totally white. We all need deliverance. We all need it. I, I've had it multiple times. There are times I'm still like, I need, I need a clean up. Right? You know, one of the main reasons we brought Joe Moody and her team in was not only for presbytery, but to minister to leaders in the church. Bethel requires their leaders to go through SOZO, which is an inner healing and deliverance model, every two years. Deliverance will make you a good leader. It'll make you a good mother, a good father, a good brother, a good sister, right? If you let it, if you let it touch you, and you're never in a place when you don't need deliverance, right? It will start transforming a region because you're dealing with something on a ground level. So this starts happening, and so so there's so much power in it that, you know, the sons of Sceva, I'm not going to read it, you can read all of this, they think, well, Paul's doing this thing, so let's, let's try it. Well, they didn't even have Jesus, and so this is an important principle. Are we all children of God? Yes. Do we all have Jesus living in us by the power of the Spirit? No. You've got to be born again. And so these guys try to cast the devil out, and the devil manifests and says, we know Jesus and we know Paul, but who are you fellas? And they mess their riches. Right? And that demon beat them up to the point that they ran out of the house naked. And it says fear fell on the whole region. And you know what started happening? Because God will even use things that look like defeats and foolishness. There was a fear that fell on the Lord, and all the occultists knew Jesus is greater than my spiritual power. He's greater. And it says that people started gathering. They were believing the word of the Lord. And did you know if you want to see a real revival, there's always got to be repentance. And they, not only did they believe the word of the Lord, did you see, remember how those, those handkerchiefs and items were anointed? Well, they got all their occultic materials that were anointed with darkness. Because there's an anointing of the spirit, and there's an anointing of darkness, and they get transferred to objects. And they took all those materials and they burned them, even though they cost a whole lot of money. They didn't sell them in a garage sale. They didn't put them on, is eBay still a thing? Or eBay or sell it through Amazon, you know, attention witches, secondhand <laughs> occultic materials. Because there's an anointing of darkness that stays with things, right? So sometimes, sometimes we have things we need to get rid of. Because not only if you want to be born again, being born again isn't enough. <laughs> I'll make you a deal on this slightly used demon, right? <laughs> Sometimes we got to do a check. We got to do an inventory checklist of not only what's in our hearts personally, but what's in our our atmosphere, and what's in our house, and what are we say? Okay, Lord, I believe you, but I'm gonna hang on to these things of darkness and play with them. Is that really repentance? So they got rid of those things, and it caused the fear of the Lord to come on a region, wow. and it took revival higher. Wow. And the third thing that Paul did was he began to address all these idols. He said things that are, are not gods at all, but made with, made with the hands of man. So when you start moving just from salvation to personal transformation to regional transformation and when that starts happening it starts affecting every realm of society so much so that all the all the people that made idols got a little ticked 
suddenly their money flow started getting shut down because people were repenting. And tradition says that that idol one day, that, that tall idol that stood in that temple, they came in one day, it's not the Bible, but it's tradition, that the head of that thing fell off by itself. Because the principality that was trying to keep a whole part of the known world in power fell under an apostolic anointing and an apostolic church that began to move in power and transformation. And it started with people getting saved. Started with people getting baptized. Started with people getting filled with the Spirit. Started with people praying in tongues and prophesying. Started with people uh, getting rid of their occultic materials. It started with people shifting their mindset and saying, you know what? I love Jesus enough that I'm not going to take dark power into his presence. Yeah. You know, I've heard people say things like, well, what's this God shall have no other gods before him? That's stupid, isn't he, God? No, if you love him enough, you won't take dark materials and immorality into his presence. And repentance began to sweep a city in a region. What happens when Ardmore starts getting transformed? And every weed shop starts shutting down. Uh-oh. Well, I just use it for better. If you need to do that, then do it. But when doctors sit at the counter writing prescriptions for everybody that walks in, I'm going to kick a sacred cow. There, there's a transformation anointing that God wants to release through a city because the king. Is coming. And he's highlighted the heart of Ardmore. And we were even down there, is it Friday afternoon? And everybody was cleaning up. And I was like, what's going on here? It's like they're getting ready for something. It's really strange because there's something of the manifest presence and glory of God that is coming to the heart of the city. But it's not just coming here, though I believe as a gateway city, we often determine what happens in the state. That's why there's always warfare in the gate. Oh, I gotta get out of here. There's too much warfare. <laughs> no. That's when you're like, God, I'm in. And I'm in on Sunday morning. I know there are people who are traveling and having jobs and some of that stuff. I, those are realities. That's awesome. But if we can't be present on a Sunday morning, we're not going to change a culture. If we can't worship on a Sunday morning when the room's not full, we're not going to change a city. Because there's something of his presence that's coming to Ardmore and that is coming to the state of Oklahoma. And I'm getting in line, just like in my dream. Sam, you pray for me. Randy, what you carry, I want in my life. That's why I go to those global conferences because I'm like, dude, Randy, pray for me. Now, it comes from the Lord, right? I mean, it was awesome getting sm smashed at my graduation. It's like a wave of his glory hit me. But when Randy Clark, Tom Jones, and St. Matthews are all praying for you, it's a good day. There's something corporately coming. There's something coming through Becca Greenwood. Something, there was an impartation of glory harvest. 
that was given to us. Was that so that we could roll around on the floor on a Sunday morning and get some chill bumps? No, it's because the Lord wanted to give us something that we carry of his glory for the harvest. And it's interesting, you know, when Paul, one thing I want to say, and I really am about to close. But he's here. And he's coming. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the Corinthian church from Ephesus, and he said, the door of effective service has been opened for me. And he basically said, but everybody's persecuting me, y'all. But you know what? Paul didn't stop and give up on his assignment because it got a little difficult. How much do we in America today if it gets a little difficult in our life, if our circumstances get a little too much, we back off what God has said to do. Oh, I just, I don't feel the anointing on that. What did God say? I'm tired this morning. Lord, I don't really want to see today. You understand. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm wanting to break the spirit of death off my servant Denise. And what we want to do is say, shock a bam, you'll do it if you want. When the Lord's like, there's a spirit of death on her, and if you'll fight it, I'll heal her. I don't mean this as condemnation, but some of us live lives of convenience. And people in other nations are saying the church in America is not ready for what's coming to them. Because we live in such a culture of convenience and ease. We don't know what to do when someone badmouths us on Facebook. The noble king is coming for his beloved. Now, he's already here, but he's so big, he's coming. He already lives in you. He's already in his temple, but he's filling his temple with glory. Lord, fill us with glory today. Fill us with your glory. God, you're, you're wanting a people that will be transformed. You're wanting a people that will transform a city. It can't just be one of us. It can't be just a few of us. Though you start with a few. But Lord, let your glory fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, let your glory fill global harvest as the water covers the sea. God, let your glory fill Carter County as the waters cover the sea. God, let your glory fill Oklahoma as the waters cover the sea. Father, I thank you that you're speaking about this state. And Lord, you said that Oklahoma would get to go first. And so, Father, we run first. And Father, we run and we say, God, let that river strike us. Let that river of your glory and your presence come upon us as the people, God. Pour out. Father, in this dry place, Father, even when we've dug a well of revival, Father, thank you that there's not just a well, but there's an outpouring. Lord, just as there was in the days of Noah, there was an outpouring from the heavens and those depths in the earth burst open and there was a flood. Let there be a flood of your glory and your presence because you're coming as a noble king and we make ourselves ready as your beloved. It's a marriage made in heaven. And Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your glory and your presence today. And I thank you that there, even in these moments there's something that you're pouring out. God, we receive it. 
Father, we receive it. We receive that corporate impartation today to see heaven come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I just felt prompted to read this word again and just declare it. I'll try to read it right this time. I am in the wind, see how I sway. Trees dancing, flowers swaying, leaves fluttering. I am blowing my wind upon the earth. Watch my little ones, watch. Look for me as the word comes and, sw and sweeps away the trash, debris, uh, clean cleaning the earth. I come as quickly and mighty as the wind goes. With me, I bring salvation, deliverance, and repentance. Here, you read the rest of it. You declare. Thank you, Lord. You start with me. I come as quickly and mighty as the wind goes. With me, I bring salvation, deliverance, repentance. As the wind blows, it brings the spiritual fire of the Lord touching each person, young and old. I come as the wind. I bring revival, restoration, renewal upon this land. I am who I say I am. I am. Wait, watch, pray, my child. I am coming. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, thank you today. We receive that. Father, thank you that there is a declaration from your daughter over this city and over this state today. Father, thank you for what you've spoken through dreams. And so, Father, we as your people declare your will and your way. Father, even today, as we proclaim these things, as we worship, Father, it's been an intercession to see the noble King Jesus come for his beloved. And Lord, we make ourselves ready today. Father, let there be oil in our lamps. Father, let there be oil in our lamps, because the lamp can't burn without oil. And Lord, we want to burn for you today. And we thank you, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, thank you, Lord. I preached a lot longer than I intended to. But the Lord wanted to produce something. He wanted to do something. And we got there. Amen. So live in that reality this week. Ball game Tuesday night. Just carry the glory to the park. <laughs> yeah, and if you have dreams like that, write them down. There's a stirring of some of these things. Amen. And uh, praise God. Um, if you need ministry, I'm going to ask my interns to come help me pray for people, whether it's for healing or encouragement, and um, be blessed. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.